So now this morning we start in verse four, and like Mike said, it, he had only the first three verses, but there was a lot in there that he did last week. Um, and there's a, so a lot of references that Pastor has in these um, lessons. So he spends a lot of time preparing these, and we'll go ahead and get into it. So this is a little bit of an overview for um, section four. So we're, we looks like we have section four, five, and six on this. So in lesson four um, is the three arenas of apostasy. And they're from the devil, from the world, and from within the church. And um, that from within the church one is, a, is a, I think, a particularly tough one to deal with. And if you talk about apostasy, the falling away, and then you have it coming from within, makes it a, a really tough thing. And, and, and we'll talk a little bit about wolf and sheep's clothing and different things like that. So um, in under A, under section four, uh, from the devil. So Satan always ha uh, has always tried to corrupt and interrupt the work of God. So let's go ahead and look at some verses. So from Jude chapter one, verse four, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained in this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, again, from the devil, uh, Matthew 13, 24 through 30. And, and this is a, a parable, and we'll go ahead and read this quickly, and you could do a whole sermon on this par, uh, parable, but we're going to go through this kind of quickly because we're talking about the apostasy, and this one is uh, from the devil. So in verse uh, 24, uh, Matthew 13, verse 24, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So his servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barns. Beautiful par parable, and Jesus is going to explain it himself here, and I, so I won't go through too much. But one of the main things to look at right here is that it's hard to distinguish between the wheat and the tares in this world. So you talk about those who believe in Christ and those who don't. It's hard to tell the difference between them as well. And, and the people that have known the truth and have fallen away from the truth, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between them, where sometimes a tear acts like a wheat and sometimes a wheat acts like a tear, and it makes it very hard to distinguish, but they're st still among us. You know what I mean? So possibly in this room, we don't know, there's a tear or two, don't know, but it would be hard for us to distinguish. But luckily, that's not our job to do that. So let's let's move on. So we'll look at um, Matthew chapter 13, verse 36, where Jesus explains it. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. So that's clear. That And that's the, uh, and under verse A, we're talking about the three arenas of apostasy. The first one in verse A is from the devil. And this is the, the example that, that we're getting from here where he says the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Then Jesus said, uh, oh, I got a double slide there. As for the tares, uh, 
are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So I have some double slides there, it looked like. All right, so um, so again, the first point, Satan has always tried to corrupt and interrupt the work of God. And the second point, and Satan uh, has always tried to infiltrate the ranks of the believer. And I think we saw some of that in that first example, but we'll also look at another example in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Uh, but there were false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring up themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through co uh, covetousness shall they with fiend words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. All right. Um, he will put his servants in the midst of true believers. So it's the, the, that's the Satan. Satan will put his servants in the midst of true believers. And we have an example from Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. And uh, so be, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And this is one that I think is particularly dangerous. It's bad enough when the wolves are out there and you're inside, you're armed to fight against the wolves that are out there. And when, and when the wolf comes, you can gather together and, and fight the wolf. Uh, I like, you know, an atheist is bad enough. He's out there, you know who he is, you know where he stands, and you can see that. But when somebody within, so a wolf wearing sheep's clothing, is in with the mist of you, it, it is more damaging, can be more damaging, and it's hard to defend against when you can't recognize where the enemy is when they're dressed like a sheep, but really they're a wolf. So that's a that's a tough thing. And um, okay, so he will try to corrupt the true believers. Again, that Satan will try to corrupt the true believers. In Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may shift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So the, the devil wanted to have his way with, with Simon. And he would, and what a, what a, what a lot of damage that Satan could have done there if he would have gained control over, over Peter. And just imagine the things that we wouldn't have had right there. That's what the devil wants for us. But we have an advocate, the Lord Jesus. And what a great thing to know that Jesus prayed for him. And he prayed for us too. And you, and you can look at that in the Bible. And you can see that J Jesus prayed for us too. And we're to pray for each other. We're, we should pray for our church that the Lord protect us. Am I going all right? Not too fast? You and right? All right, I'll keep moving then. All right, the three arenas of apostasy. So now you can see I got A collapse and B expanded here on the screen there because now we're looking at section B under section four and from the world. So first we talked about the apostasy from the devil. Now we're talking about apostasy from the world. And we'll look at Revelations chapter 2, verses 19 through 23. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent for, uh, of her fornication, and she repented not. 
God is a merciful God, but if you know if if you never come to repentance, then then there's a problem there. But you could see that uh, God didn't take it lightly about someone. It's bad enough when you don't believe. It's bad enough when you're contrary. But when you try to influence God's people and, and do that, I think God takes uh, an offense there, and um, He takes it very serious. So behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. All right. The world, has, uh, the world always wants the church to compromise. And, you know, that the thing about compromising and sometimes it looks so little just compromise a little bit but does that satisfy the world it never does and then they want you to compromise again and compromise again and next thing you know you're not what you used to be so but that, that's how things work it, it, you know that when you're trying to change someone's mind it's just constantly working on compromise so the, when we have the true word of truth we don't have to do any compromise and we shouldn't do any compromise because it is the truth. The world has always want the church to compromise. So let's look at Galatians chapter three, verses one through three. O foolish Galatians, who hath, be, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? All right, so giving up the truth is a sin. And, and it's a, to me, it's a sad thing when you have the truth, and then, then you give it up. And uh, so we'll look at Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all inequity and purify in himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And like Brother Mike pointed out uh, last week and, and how pastors pointed out before, um, the best way to know if something's a counterfeit is to know what the real thing looks like. And we have the real thing in our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the real thing in God's word. So if you have something that's contrary to God's word, you know that that's uh, false. And, and you don't have to, and you shouldn't add to, the word of God. And uh, so that was uh, giving up the truth as a sin. Uh, letter B, taking in a lie is always a, a sin. So Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Now, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth of men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as uh, theirs also was. Now, I'm moving kind of quickly because we still have a, a whole lot to cover, and I'd, I'd like to kind of go over a little more detail in each one of these. But um, we got the verses there. You have the study sheets, too, and, and you can go back and, and look at those. But we're just touching on the examples here. So the world has nothing that we should want, and uh, it makes a lot of sense. What, but have you ever found yourself a little bit jealous of what the world has? Sometimes I think, we can find ourselves doing that. But when we reason with what we have in Christ, that should take that away. 
There is nothing that we have uh, that we're lacking through Christ. But the world has nothing that we should want. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. But ye are not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Isn't that beautiful right there? Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So when you think about that, that man, heaven, the God of the universe is my heavenly father. And all these things that he wants for us, what do we have to be jealous of the world for? So now um, section B is now collapsed and we have uh, section C expanded. So we're going to talk about from within the church and we'll look at Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30 first. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, uh, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So the Apostle Paul knew what was coming, and there were some people that were from within the church that were giving him a lot of anguish, and they were doing a lot of damage, and might have caused the Apostles Paul visit there to run short. And, and he was uh, uh, leaving there, and he was warning them about, ravenous wolves wolves so and and you know in reality the wolf is the enemy of the sheep the wolf wants to eat and devour uh, the sheep and as a sheep on our own we don't have much defense we have to we have to be up by the shepherd in our case it's the good shepherd that we have so from, from within the church so these are again the arenas of apostasy and we're talking about apostasy so from within the church they will do it for money and we'll look at first timothy chapter 3 verse 3 not given to wine nor striker not greedy of filthy lucre but patient not a brawler not covetousness that's uh, we're as as a believer in christ as a follower of christ that's not the life that we're supposed to live we're, we're drunken where we're a brawler and we're not supposed to be after filthy lucre but we're supposed to be patient not a brawler not covetous they will do it for, for freedom to live in sin and, and and this one I think is is a big one and, it, and it's almost um, it's a weird thing to say that the freedom to live in sin man that, that who would want to do that anyway but because with the sin, there's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And, and that lure is out there. And when you're here in church, talking about God, reading about God, learning about God, listening to the preaching, fellowshipping with other fellow Christians in there, in a sense, it kind of takes away from your freedom to live in sin. So if, if the, it's a sinful life that one is wanting to live in, then... That, that's another uh, area for apostasy to grow. The falling away or, or the, the retreating from, the going away from what, what is true. So 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. That's dealing with the apostasy from within the church. It's talking about the manner which to do that. So it's not talking about the people without the church. It's talking about the people 
from within the church. So um, from within the church again, they will do it for the ability to yield power over the church. Um, that That is something we have to be aware of too. I, I mentioned um, for all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That pride of life is a tough one. And I don't know if you all think things like me, but sometimes you got to watch in your pride even about being humble. It, it, that sound weird? Like, for example, I'm the humblest person I know. Well, we wouldn't. that would be kind of funny thing to say because you wouldn't be having real humility there. But sometimes in the church, um, we can actually have pride with how good we are or how, um, how much we serve or, and different things like that. And we could ha also want to have power in the church in that. The best thing I can do for myself is uh, when God calls on me to do something, do it. And then don't have to worry about what others think. Don't have to worry about where that puts you. If it, if it, if it uh, either abases you or elevates you and all that, you don't have to worry about that stuff. When you know you're in the will of God, it's a good thing to do there. But to, to want to gain power in the church can be another way that uh, uh, people that fall away can want to gain power and influence over other people. So, uh, uh, 3 John chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. I wrote unto the church of Diotrephus, I, I'm sure I slaughtered that, uh, who, uh, who loveth to have the, the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, Pratting against us with malicious words and not con content with, therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil has seen God. So that in that example there, they wanted to have preeminence even among the, the apostles. And, and, and uh, they wouldn't receive them and they wouldn't receive others. And, and he warns of that. So, uh, again, speaking of the apostasy from within the church, the truth is never changed, nor should, should it ever be diluted. Because that would be changing it also. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. All right, so now, now we're going to the, the next section, section five. And we're looking at the three regions of the Lord's judgment. And we'll look at verse uh, five through 16. Now, so... Uh, Let's see, do I have that on here? Well, I'm going to look at the... Let me see here. I'm going to look at verse 5, uh, and this is in Jude now. So I put... Uh, in this slide I have Jude chapter 1, verse 5, and I also have 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 10 on there, because that's... the 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 is the reference... That's being pointed out. But in, for, in Jude chapter 1, verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And there's a, um, a big story there about people that rose up against Moses and Aaron and uh, thought that they took too much upon, among themselves and they got a bunch of the princes of Israel together, and, and they were rebelling against Moses and Aaron. And uh, God opened up the earth and swallowed them and brought down fire and got others. And then the next day, the people were murmuring against Moses and Aaron that they killed God's people, and God caused the plague and killed uh, 14,700 more people. There was a lot of judgment of God that was done at that part. And, and this is the reference that they're talking about in both of these verses. Ver, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Neither murmur ye, 
as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. That that's God did that uh, out of judgment. And murmuring, don't you hate murmuring? You know, so it's like when someone talks kind of, you know, out loud where you can kind of hear it, but not they're not fully talking to you and you just hear it a little bit. They want you to know, kind of know what they're saying, but not in full. And they're murmuring against you. Kids do it. A lot of people do it when they're uh, under the authority of someone else. Like children might do it to their parents. A person at work might do it to their boss. Or they kind of murmur to see how far they can get away with something, but they don't fully uh, stand up like that. Well, um, Cora, I believe it was, and, and some others who, who did stand up to Moses and basically were rebelling, and God took care of that. And then the children of Israel murmured against Moses uh, and Aaron. So, so we, we talked about the Lord judges his people, and we saw an example of that. And the Lord judges his creation. Uh, and this is in verse 6. In, a, in Jude chapter 1, verse 6, And the angels would kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation he hath reserved in, in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And these, by the way, are going to move a lot faster now. I noticed that where section four had a lot more verses, and this one just is more discussion about the verse in Jude. So the, the Lord judges his critics. So back to Jude, verse seven, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So the, the Lord judges his critics, and now we're going to talk about uh, the rebellion in verse 8 through 10 in Jude. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, angel, when contending with the devil, he, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring him, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, "The Lord rebuke thee." But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally are brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. And we also have, uh, you know, again, the Lord judges his critics, the covetous. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withered without fruit, twice dead and plucked upon the roots. That, that, I've got to pause here just to say, you think about, there's also a proverb that talks about a, boasting about being like a puffed up like a cloud without water and all that. It's like it could look like a big, look like something spectacular, but there's really nothing there. So if you think about these things here, clouds that are without water, they're really not good for anything. They don't really have any any power there. Carried about of winds, trees trees whose fruit withered. Well, that's what what good is a fruit tree whose whose fruit withered, or without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And then uh, we're looking at, again, the Lord judges his critics, the wicked. And we'll look at verses 14 through 16. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prof prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to con convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches 
which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's uh, persons in admiration because of advantage. And when you think about the horrible, wicked things that could be done in this world, and it, in verse 16, it lists out murmurers and complainers. And we sometimes think really lightly about that murmurers and complainers can do a lot of damage within the church. And we're not, you know, it, we could talk about murders. We could talk about a whole bunch of stuff. But we have the capability within ourselves to be murmurers and complainers at time. And it's things that we need to look out for and know that that is not the way God wants it to be. Murmuring and complaining isn't the way. It's better to at least have a serious conversation with someone than to murmur and to complain. Because when you're murmuring and complaining, a lot of times it's it's behind uh, the authority of the church. And you're going person to person. And it you can see how it like spreads like a disease, right? You know, one you tell this person that and, and it grows and, and it can infest things. So even though these could look kind of lightly with all the different kind of sins we can come up with, with all the evil things that we could think of in this world that you have listed here, murmurers and complainers. All right, so now we go to section six. And we're, we're actually getting closer to being finished here. And uh, wow, I really went through those fast, didn't I? Quite a few verses pretty quick. But we're going to go ahead and look at these are reminders to the faithful. So I hope you're here with me with that intent in mind to be faithful. And here's some reminders for you. Never be intimidated by loudmouths. This that's that's pastor's heading right there. I kind of like it. It kind of sounds like him a little bit right there. Never be intimidated by loudmouths. And we'll look at a in verse 17 through 29. So, uh, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. There should be, these be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. I didn't get all those verses down there. Well, you could look at those uh, on your own. Okay, so I just have it listed there incorrect. Thank you, Brother Mike. Better yet. Never lose uh, your faith in God's promises. Uh, verses 20 through 21, which makes sense. Then we go to verse 20 now. But ye, be, uh, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourself selves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ until eternal life. And uh, we're going through these, uh, but when you really think about it, what a, a beautiful chapter or book we have in, in Jude that so much is being said. Uh, it gives us the what... Uh, the tools that we need it, it, ta it tells us about what we should be aware of and it also given us reminders of how the faithful should act and uh, I, I always think that's so amazing um, and it's the it's the Holy Spirit of God working in these men leading them to do those kind of things which I think is just incredible when we could spend so much time teaching and preaching on these things and they wrote it so concise and so informative, no words being wasted. I'm just amazed that when I read the Word of God, I'm just amazed at nothing better than when I read the red letters and the uh, the amount of information, the amount of power that comes so concisely from the Word of God. Okay, uh, and see, and, and we're going to finish up here, and we're going to finish up a little bit earlier. You can go back to fellowship. Maybe there's some donuts left over. I don't know, but it'd be a good time or some coffee to grab that uh, those of you online you're on your own with whatever you got at your house there but probably some pretty good stuff too so uh the last letter c never forget to share what god has given to you 
And even before we look at that verse is, that is a message that we see all throughout the Bible. And, you know, I mentioned other, I don't know who first coined it, but we're beggars telling other beggars where we found bread is so true. So this isn't our invention. It's the word of God. We don't have power to save, but we can point to the person who does. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. And the gifts that God gives us are to be shared. So let's go ahead and look at verse 22 through 25. And, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and uh, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power, power both now and ever. Amen. And we're going to stop there. But uh, the, the note that was there is he that winneth souls is wise. And we talk about uh, winning souls. We're just pointing them to Jesus. And then everyone has the choice to make that. It's kind of a sad thing to have the faith and not to share the faith with others, to tell them about the blessings of God and to warn them about the things that God has uh, in store for those who don't believe. It's our, our job to do that. And it's not a job that we have to do out of um, drudgery. We can do that out of joy and out of thanksgiving. So uh, let's pray and uh Brother Odell, would you mind closing us in a word of prayer, please? What presented to us today, Lord, and uh, Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you would just be with each and every one of us on our prayer list, too, Lord, and uh, Lord, that you would just be with them, Lord, and, uh, and give them some strength, Lord, the ones that's in need, Lord. And, Lord, I do pray for for this, for this church, Lord, that it would prosper, Lord, and, uh, and we can see souls saved, Lord. And, uh, and Lord, we just ask you to be with Brother Bob, Lord, and, uh, as he taught us that lesson, Lord, and uh, just uh, give him strength, Lord, and just keep doing what he's doing, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we just love you and thank you for everything that you have done for us, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, in your name, amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.